what's new on the Burlington waterfront. Hey, now it's happening at the waterfront on Lake Champlain. Whatever the weather, there's much to do on the new waterfront, the Burlington waterfront. Good morning and welcome to On the Waterfront with Melinda. I'm your host, Melinda Moulton, and today my guest is Gary DeCarlis. And I am so excited to have him on my show because a couple of weeks ago, um, Gary had me on his show and now the tables are turned and we're going to find out all about Gary and his life and his work uh, in Burlington. So thank you, Gary, for being on my show today. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you. I'm honored. Well, I so loved having being interviewed by you. You're a terrific interviewer, so I hope I can do half as well as you did with me. Um, I want to start out by allowing you to share with our viewers uh, a little bit about yourself. Where did you come from? Uh, who was your mentor? Talk about, about your early life. Sure. I was born in Dunkirk, New York, uh, which is uh, along Lake Erie. I just lived there for the first year of my life, and then my family moved to New Jersey. My father had just graduated from Fredonia State College as a music teacher. And his first job was as a music therapist in a neuropsychiatric hospital in Skillman, New Jersey. So we were living in Hopewell, which was right next to Skillman. And um, that was a very, uh, it was an, an amazing job for him, but also probably in that, I'll tell you a story that probably shaped a lot of who I am today. So like many fathers, my father would take me to work with him. And um, so I, I can remember one day where we were I was maybe three years old, we were walking in a, one of the buildings, we're getting to where he worked and we would walk down the steps. And at the bottom of the steps was a, literally a cage. Um, and in the cage was straw on the floor and a naked man in that cage, someone with probably profound disabilities. And then we made a left-hand turn into this big hall where my father worked with people who had pretty severe uh, disabilities. And uh, most of the world had given up on these people. And then, I, so my father, as a music therapist, introduced music to them. and the smiles on their faces, the joy that he brought to them, the connection that he made with each of them that they mattered to him um, was, was really, in many ways, uh, it, it kind of seeped into my brain, so to speak. And so um, years later, when I was old, much older and thinking about what I wanted to do with my life, I remember the day when I decided to become a social work major in undergraduate school, um, a lot of that focused back on the, that day with him, um, just seeing what, A, what love can do, and B, what music can do. It's a universal language and can bring joy to the most difficult situation. So that was my, my early life there. We moved to diff three different places in New Jersey. I, literally was brought up in probably East Brunswick where my father was the music teacher at East Brunswick High School. And I ended up having him as my teacher for four years. It was quite a, a nice time for us to be together. Um, so um, yeah, so that was my early life. My, uh, my father is one of those people that uh, certainly I look to um, about how he handled life. He always was, um, not only just a music teacher, but he also was a leader within the music field. And when he would have quartets, he would play nightclubs. He was a jazz saxophone player as well. And he was always the, the leader of the group. He'd negotiate the contract with the, the uh, bar owner, or um, you know, he was eventually later in his life, he was the president of the music union in New Jersey. And um, of course was the band leader. Um, and so, yeah, so he was certainly a, a played a big role in my, my life um, in many ways. Um, loved children, loved working with people, um, brought joy to thousands of people through music and through who he was as a person. Um, yeah, so that's... What a, what a beautiful story. 
Um, did you ever get into music? Did you follow your father's? I did. You know, I was a saxophone player as well. Um, and, um, but, it, you know, I think there's musicians and there's people who appreciate music. And I fall on the appreciate music side of things. He had a gift. Um, he probably had in his head over 400 songs that he could play at any point in time. If you said, you know, play uh, Moonlight Serenade, he could play Moonlight Serenade. Um, he was that kind. And I, so it was a great story. This is probably a, another one of those times where your life veers to the left or right. So it was, it was a summer school for music. My father was, you know, during the summers, he would have a music class and a, a band. And so I was in it playing first alto and we were playing the song Moonlight Serenade. And so he, I knew, he knew that in that song was quite a alto sax solo. And so here was his son's coming out, so to speak. It's like my turn comes, I stand up, start to solo and I could not get a note out of that saxophone other than a squeak. And about uh, 30 seconds into the squeak, I sat down defeated. <laughs> he must have felt terrible at what was going on. I, I don't know, it was either my uh, jaw was tight or the reed was not right, but anyhow, or there was a leak in the, in the padding, whatever. But it, was, it, was, it happened, it was one of those things that happens. But I think in many ways that, that kind of symbolizes how I was not going to be the jazz saxophone player that my father was. And I, he was so good that um, I, it would have been hard for any, any son or daughter to try to replicate what he was able to do with that instrument. He was an amazing saxophone player. So I moved in different directions, but certainly influenced a lot by him. You certainly had moved into into um, into the into a direction that your father guided you to with all of your your service, uh, your selfless service to our community. So what? So tell me what happened. Uh, where where did you where did you your your teenage years were in New Jersey, and then where did you move on to? What brought you to Vermont? Yeah, so I I went to uh, Kane University in New Jersey for undergraduate school in social work, and then. Um, started, I went to graduate, I actually, another one of these turning points in life, I had been accepted to Columbia University Graduate School of Social Work and got a full scholarship. Um, and I was all excited. I was going to go to New York City. The, 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 the thread that I was following was community organizing. And um, about in June of that year, I just graduated from school. And I called Columbia because I hadn't heard about the fall uh, classes yet or where I was going to live. And I wanted to get more information about all this. So I called the office and they said, um, well, hold on a second, Mr. DeCarlos. We want to check something. So they, there's a pause on the phone. They come back and they said, we have made a terrible mistake. We put your acceptance papers in the rejected file. We have given your scholarship to someone else. And we could only offer you half of what we were originally going to give you. Well, I was crestfallen because there was no way I could afford Columbia <clears throat> on my own. And so I never went. Okay. And I ended up going, uh, working in Newark, New Jersey for three years as, as a social worker in the corrections department. They had a community-based correctional center there. Then at the end of that, I went to Michigan State to graduate school in criminology because I all the things that I saw in the correctional system, which bothered me, I wanted to do something about. So I thought if I get my PhD in criminology, I can help reform the correctional system. Well, after a year, when I walked into graduate school, I found myself sitting with about 18 other police officers. It was the most conservative graduate program that you can imagine. <laughs> it was not for me. <laughs> So I finished a year there. At the end of that year, uh, Eugene McCarthy happened to be giving a talk. He was running for president as an independent. This is 1975. And, um, he, um, and I was captured by his vision of what the country could be. And so my partner and I decided to 
volunteer for him to get him on the ballot in Michigan. And then off we went. After that, we were asked to go to Maine to help him get on the ballot in Maine. And we ended up visiting 23 states around the country with him, helping get him on the ballot across the country. Um, and in the end, we went back to Washington, D.C. and was on his staff um, until election day. In fact, on election night, I was in a hotel room with Eugene McCarthy and a few of his other staff watching the results come in. And they weren't, it wasn't pretty. He, he, where he was doing quite well, but as a third party candidate, at the end, people had to decide, do we vote for Eugene McCarthy, do we believe in, or do we vote for one of the other two candidates so I guess it was Jimmy Carter uh, and Gerald Ford to knowing that that vote might matter. So he ended up with less than 1% of the vote at the end. Um, and then from there, I had to decide, well, where do I want to live? And a friend of mine had invited me up to Vermont where she had moved. And a bunch of my undergraduate friends had moved um, since 1972. So I went to visit them. and fell in love with the city. I remember we had lunch on Lake Champlain in June, and you look at the lake and the Adirondacks and this great city behind it. And I said, oh, oh my gosh, I've got to move here. So I did and finished my graduate work in counseling up at the University of Vermont. And uh, it's been a, just a love affair ever since then. Wow, how exciting. So you actually got in, got your toe dipped into politics in a really big way. I did, you know, and I, I wrote about that. I, there, I have an unpublished book that I wrote that actually um, all the stories that happen in a seven or eight month campaign when you're traveling around the country and the election laws and, and all that kind of stuff. It's um, a nice manuscript that I have from those days. When I moved to the old north end of Burlington, um, within five years, I was running for city council in Burlington and, and was fortunate enough to win. Um, and I spent three terms on the city council in the early 1980s, part of the early progressives that were moving into the city and working with Bernie. How exciting, Bernie's, Bernie's rise in his career. Amazing, yes. Amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. So, um, so this gives me, this gives our viewers a real good background on how you sort of ended up where you ended up in your career, starting from the very beginning and the influence of your dad. Um, so let's, let's move into a little bit about, uh, about what you've done since you came to Vermont. Share with our viewers some of the extraordinary uh, work that you've been doing in, in what? You've been here for almost 45 years? Yeah. Yeah, 45 years, minus 10, I was in Washington from 93 to 03. I was chief of children's mental health for the federal government. But um, most of my years have been in, um, in Vermont and in human service administration. There was a point in time in my life where um, actually, you know, it was, I had to decide what I wanted to do. I was on the city council for three terms. Um, I had been at the same time I was on the city council, I was a therapist at the University of Vermont in the counseling center. Um, and I um, was thinking of running for mayor of Burlington. And then my daughter, Emily, was born. And Emily has special needs. And I, I realized that I couldn't take that risk uh, in politics with my daughter just being born. So I decided that I was going to focus more on the administrative side of human services, uh, where I could make a decent living, hopefully do good for the community and the state. And um, you know, I started um, with the Department of Mental Health and I helped shape a children's unit there, um, helped design a children's mental health system and became deputy commissioner of mental health and developmental disabilities for about six years. And then um, from there, I went to Washington for 10, came back to Vermont, and for a while had a consulting business um, that was focused on uh, training up people to be savvy leaders in, in community systems and being 
particularly sensitive to communities that were in a change mode, that were moving from one point to another. And then after a number of years of doing that, I um, was asked to help out the Turning Point Center of Chittenden County for a couple months. They were in between executive directors. So a friend of mine who was on their board said, could you help us out for three months? And I said, I'd be more than happy to do that. And I walked into the Turning Point Center of Chittenden County, which is a recovery center for people in recovery from alcohol and drug ad addiction. And um, I fell in love with what, what was happening there. I mean, these were people that were climbing out of years of addiction. And uh, no matter how many times were beaten down, wanted to do something for themselves. And this, this safe place that um, was created um, was what gave them the room to grow their recovery. And so that three months ended up eight years. Had a one, lot of wonderful people, amazing people, talented people. And um, it was interesting, at the same time I was doing that, my wife Barbara and I had taken a little vacation to Manchester, Vermont, took a history tour down there. And I, so I was about 62 years old when this was going on, all this turning point vacation. And I, in the middle of the history tour, I said to Barbara, I said, honey, I could do this in Burlington. Nobody is doing any history in this great city of ours that I happen to love. And I'm, I'm a history, I have a lot of interest in history and my father, besides being a musician, was a, a Abraham Lincoln aficionado. He probably had 50 to 70 books of Abraham Lincoln that he had read over his lifespan. So I loved history. And so I came back to Burlington from that vacation um, and thought, I can put together a history tour of this city that I think people would really enjoy. And having been on the city council, you know, and steeped in its history, and so I did. And because I took that three month gig that turned into eight years uh, and was full time, I did the tours on the weekends for all those eight years and connected with uh, the Rhodes Scholar Program, the Ollie Program at the University of Vermont, and then my own tours. And it's been a wonderful thing. I've just enjoyed doing it. It's got me even more close to the work, the history of the city than I ever thought but I would, I, I'm always reading about something new about the city. Um, and um, yeah, so here I am almost nine years later, still doing those history tours and still loving them. Well, Gary, we're gonna move into that in a minute, but I do wanna tell our viewers that you did receive some major federal and national awards in recognition of your outstanding service and leadership in human services, including two Vice Presidential Hammer Awards for Government Innovations and the first National Wraparound Award for Changing Public Policy to Promote Wraparound. Um, so I want to congratulate you on that and for your accomplishments and for your service helping uh, people to reclaim their lives. Um, it's noble work and for that we all thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to move now into your business that you have now called Burlington History Tours. And I became um, exposed to that uh, through Facebook primarily and was not really aware of, of what, you know, I'm hoping that all the history that we have down here at Main Street Landing is part of your tour because um, mm. we do have a lot of history and we yes. did a video on the history of the Burlington Waterfront. But why don't you, why don't you walk us through what it would be like for somebody if they wanted to, to, um, to take your tour? What, what's the sure. process and what would they see? So I, whether it's a walking tour or a band tour, and I do give both, um, some people just, they're not able to walk that, you know, with that many steps around the inner part of the city. So I have a van and um, holds up to 10 people. But we start at Battery Park. Um, there's so much lake history that, that we, that's right there in front of them. So I, I start them by talking about two large Indian nations that were right in front of us, uh, the Iroquois and the Algonquin nations. And then, um, um, and then talk about Champlain coming into the lake at one time <clears throat> and had a profound impact on where things ended up because of his 
visit. I mean, he brought guns. He, they had, those Indian nations had never seen a gun until Champlain came into that, that lake in, uh, years and years ago. And so, um, um, so we start there and then we come through um, the French and Indian War, the uh, Revolutionary War, a lot of it happening right on the lake in front of us here and right in Burlington. And then I talk about the early development of the city. Um, lumber became a big part of Burlington's history. You've got some great pictures of all of that. Um, and, um, and then the War of 1812, you know, there were 4,000 soldiers wrapped around Battery Park. It was the jump off point for any conflict with Canada during that the War of 1812 and the Battle of Plattsburgh as well. Um, and I focus on some of our Civil War generals because we have the statue of General Wells in Battery Park and talk about him a little bit. Um, and then I go down, if we're in the van, I would go down into the where Burlington began as a village, you know, down at the bottom of bat, what we call Battery Street today and uh, King Street. And, that area there, and there's some significant homes, Dr. Pomeroy's home, and, um, um, and so we, you know, I take them through there, and then I bring them up, I show them the uh, Follette House, that beautiful, where Palm, Palmerlo real estate is, talk about that history, and then we weave up to the university eventually, and the, the history around that, and General Lafayette visiting, and then the three public cemeteries, um, where Ethan Allen, Ira Allen are buried, and many Civil War generals in Lakeview, Ira Allen and Ethan Allen are in Greenmount, which is sadly a forgotten cemetery in this city, and I'm very troubled by how the city has not kept it up. But that's another story for another time, perhaps. But um, yeah, and then we ended at Ethan Allen's homestead. Um, it's about a two and a half hour van tour. It's about an hour and a half walking tour of the downtown area. Great history, much bigger than the size of the city. So how do people how do people sign up? Well, they would most people, TripAdvisor is big, my big my biggest fan. People go to TripAdvisor that are gonna vacation in, in the area and they'll see, I think um, I have almost all five stars. Um, and so they would just send me an email. I have a website. Um, BurlingtonHistoryTours.com. Yep. And um, they would usually send me an email or call me, and then we'll I'll make get their reservation, and I'll tell them I'll meet them at Battery Park at ten o'clock one day of the week, and away we go. God, that's fascinating. Now, how many years have you been doing this? This is the ninth year on right now. Wow. Yep. So November will be nine years. Wow, how so many, people how many from all over the world come to do your Burlington history tour? I, so you know, I've, yeah, I've met people from all over the world and um, and then many Burlington citizens, too, that have an interest in their history. But it's amazing. So tell our viewers what it costs to take your tour. So if it's a walking tour, it's forty dollars per person. If it's a van tour, it's forty-five dollars per person. That's and, so, um, so affordable. And so to my viewers, um, I don't care how long you've lived here. I'm sure Gary has a lot of information that, that none of us know about the history of the city we love. Visit his website at Burlington History Tours, all spelled out. dot com. Is there a number that they can call you? Do you or do you prefer to do yeah. it over the internet? No, they can call me at eight zero two. Three one zero five two five five. Let's talk for a second here because uh, you know we're coming to the end of our interview, and my gosh, I could talk to you forever. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this history museum that you're talking about. Are you, that you're well, you know, yeah. So one of my, if I I think the city is missing something, and that's a museum. I mean, there is so much history in this city. I'm not going to be able to do tours you know, for into the infinitum. I mean, my day will come and we, we really could have a wonderful museum that, um, for, let me give you an example. I gave a, I was giving a, a lecture a couple years ago on Civil War Generals of Burlington. 
and I was mentioning General Wells, who the statue is in Battery Park. And at the end of the lecture, a gentleman came up to me and he says, Gary, the picture you showed of General Wells when it was unveiled in 1913, the 50th year anniversary of Battle of Gettysburg that Wells was a part of, he said, um, I, my grand, great grandfather is in your picture. And he showed me where his great grandfather, and he said, every soldier that attended that event that day received a book of all the soldiers that Wells led and a medal was given to them. Um, and he had the book and the medal with wow. him. And I said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Well, that book and that medal should be in a museum for others to see. This gentleman um, went home with those, who knows whatever happened to them. Another time, um, you know, there's uh, what we call Rock Dunder or Otsiotso out on the lake between Juniper Island and Shelburne Bay. There's a little outcropping, rock outcrop. Has a lot of history, um, both from a Native American point of view, the Algonquin Nation, as well as the Revolutionary War. Well, there's a long story. We don't have time for the story, but a couple of gentlemen had dove in that, right near that rock, and pulled up cannonball. And those cannonballs should be in that museum, but they're not, because we don't have one. Have you, have you talked to the, I mean, I was thinking about the Ethan Allen homestead, would there be a way to expand somewhere on that property to create a Burlington Museum that would be tied in with the Ethan Allen well, homestead? Well, I, I think it should, I think they should have a relationship for sure. I think it should be downtown. It should be a place, you know, much more in the center of the city versus yeah, Ethan right. Allen's homestead. I agree. Yeah. Well, why don't we why don't we collaborate on that? That would be a fun project. I would love to do that. And the I other thing, and, and I other thing I want to tell you is my husband always has wanted to do a history of Lake Champlain in like an eight part series for Vermont Public Television. Mm. Um, and you know the he he's uh, a he's a filmmaker and a producer and yes. um, he you know he it's a it's a dream of his is to do it like an eight part series on the history of Lake Champlain because it's so rich and amazing and. Uh. So I think two of you need to come together and collaborate a little bit on how to maybe to make that happen. Um, I would love that. And see if Vermont Public Television would be willing to maybe help to produce it. And there yeah. could be some fundraising opportunities too, but I'll hook you up with Rick on to talk about that because this this history needs to be told. It, and, you're it, right. it, and you're right. Absolutely. And you're absolutely. right. Absolutely. No, I mean, we're all trying to do our little pieces, but it's all got to come together. So I, I think, you know, I'll get you together with Rick and you two can- Good. <laughs> when you shoot that all together, I think you two could be a great team. Um, so I want to just thank you for all that you've done for this community and all the service that you've done, helping people find the bright light in their lives and move through from the dark into the light. And so I want to ask you, any interest in running for mayor? Has that crossed your mind? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought, yes, it has crossed my mind over the years, but uh, you know, life takes you in different places. And, um, Things like that have to queue up just right in my mind, and uh, for different reasons, it hasn't. So I'm good with that. And the other thing I wanted to ask you is, were you on the city council when I was coming through with my project? Uh, let's see. That I was on from '82 to '88. Yep. So you would have been so, there. You would yep. have been there during the Alden years. Yes, that's absolutely right. So I would have um, worked with you, and we would have seen each other, and we would have been you know in yep. the Main Street Landing and so you and I've known each other and for by decades way, and by the <laughs> way to our viewers we were born in the same year we both are 71 <laughs> exactly. and, and I think I'm just a couple of months older than you <laughs> yeah. but you look a lot younger so you, we'll be, you, look, you look fabulous Gary so I want to thank you so much for your time thank and, you um, and and we'll we'll talk again and, and I so look forward to taking your tour and to get right. to know you better, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll kibitz about some stuff here. We've got some good energy that's, going. That's great. Thank you, right. Melinda. Thank I appreciate you. the opportunity. All right. Thank you, my friend. We'll talk soon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.